All right. So uh, welcome. Uh, hopefully uh, we uh, are, are now live, I believe, to the uh, to the world. We're good. Awesome. So thanks to everyone uh, here in Seattle uh, and everyone that's streaming in from everywhere else. Welcome to the Airflow Summit 2002 Seattle edition. Uh, so glad you could all make it. This is awesome. Um, we have a really great lineup of presenters, a uh, bunch of them here live. We've got a, a, a remote presentation and a, a, a pre-recorded one as well. So looking forward to that. Uh, 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 great content. At the end of each session, we're going to have a Q&A. We've got uh, folks here in the audience that are going to pull the questions from Crowdcast. So anyone who is uh, out there uh, watching it uh, watching it across Crowdcast, please put your questions in. We'll make sure they're answered. And we also have a mic for the folks here in the audience so we can walk around and, uh, and actually get some questions from the folks here that have questions to ask. Um, so with that, um, fortunately, uh, it, it's super easy to do the transition to the first presentation because that's me. Uh, so that makes life a lot easier. I don't have to worry about shuffling things around or making sure the mic's uh, correct or not for everyone else here. We're good to go. So uh, uh, my name is John Jackson. I'm the uh, principal product manager responsible for Amazon managed workflows for Apache Airflow. I'm so glad to be here and uh, also very privileged to be part of the uh, organizing committee for the Airflow Summit. So it's been great being able to put the, this event and a lot of other things together and, and being able to see all the fantastic content that's been going on all week. Um, uh, just some background on me. I'm obviously part of AWS. I have uh, been here for a little over two years and uh, really happy to be, uh, be part of this, uh, this great uh, Airflow community. So today I'm going to be talking about um, uh, sort of giving some background on the service. I think most folks probably are aware of it by now because it's been around for about a year and a half, but I'll do some just some recap on what it is and what some of the milestones we hit are. And then I want to really get into some ideas of how it's built you know, just to sort of set the framework as to exactly what we'll be discussing. And then we're going to talk into a few key topics I know people have had some issues with, and I want to make sure we get a chance to really review these in depth. One is about handling, how you handle your web servers uh, and how that are, uh, is affected by the architecture. Um, also, I get into the use of the local runner, the ability to, you know, take a, uh, a Docker version and, and really test your code that way. We'll get into a few of just some of the general best practices with the, uh, with, the service and some of the best ways to, to manage it. Um, then I also want to get into our open source uh, and you know, a bit of a spoiler, we have a bunch of our open source folks here, so we'll be able to have them uh, uh, sort of uh, give a wave. And then we'll be talking really about what's next uh, with uh, MWA and what, we're, what we'll be working on. So, uh, and as I said, we'll have a Q&A at the end, so please you know, keep, keep in mind any questions you might have, that'd be awesome. Uh, so a little background on our service. Uh, you know, Amazon Managed Workflows for Apache Airflow, first of all, is open source Apache Airflow. It's the exact same code. We haven't forked it. We haven't changed it. Uh, we do contribute to it, uh, but we only pull from, from the same open source software that everyone else gets. Um, out of the box, the security is really easy on it. It uses uh, AWS uh, identity management uh, throughout. Uh, um, and uh, what that gives you both is a single place to manage how you're accessing the user interface but also give you a way to manage what the Airflow system can access without having to go through and manage a bunch of individual connections. You can do it all from IAM. Um, and it's also out of the box is integrated. It's um, not just with IAM, but also it runs on ECS Fargate. Uh, it uses Cl Amazon CloudWatch for metrics and for logging. Uh, and of course, Amazon S3 for all the storage needs for it as well. And it's also reasonably easy to deploy. You can go to the console, you can click a few buttons, it's gonna start up for you. You can use CloudFormation. We have API support, CLI support, you use Terraform, whatever you'd like to do on it. Uh, and uh, you're able to stand up an Airflow environment reasonably easily. So just a little history on the service. So we launched this in November, 2020. Uh, so as I said, it's about 18 months old, give or take. Um, in uh, May 2021, we offered uh, Airflow 2.0 for the first time. Yeah, we weren't as quick as we'd like to be, but we got it out. Uh, in August of that year, we managed to roll out uh, in a, to an additional or a total of 15 commercial regions. And in just this past January, we added not only Airflow 2.2 support, but we also gave the ability to install requirements and plugins on the web server. Uh, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that uh, moving forward as well. So... I want to dig a little bit into the architecture and how we built this. Because really, we built this the same way that anyone could build an Airflow deployment on AWS themselves. So we're using a bunch of off-the-shelf AWS components to be able to make the most out of what Airflow can do. 
So within your customer virtual private cloud, within your VPC, that's where we're running the Airflow scheduler containers and the Airflow worker containers. As I mentioned, we're using ECS Fargate. Um, the schedulers, you can have up to five of them or as, as few as two. It it's, comes with two out of the box, so it's uh, immediately high availability. And for the Airflow workers, you can e choose uh, as low a minimum as one, maximum of 25, and you can have it auto scale in between those two. We're also using a bunch of off-the-shelf AWS components to connect all the Airflow bits and pieces together. So these need to be accessible from your VPC as well. So uh, as I mentioned, we use CloudWatch for logging and metrics. Uh, we use S3, that's where all your DAGs and plugins and requirements uh, text lives. Uh, we use SQS as the uh, queue for the, uh, for the Celery executor. The Airflow images themselves live on ECR. And if you choose a customer managed key, we're accessing using uh, KMS for that purpose. So the reason I bring all this stuff up is because we're running the workloads on your, on your VPC, all this needs to be accessible. Not a big deal if you have a NAT gateway and you're running to the internet anyways, but if it's all private, you need to make sure that you have routing to all this sort of stuff, especially when you get into sort of you know, security requirements and managing what the, the security groups can handle. It's just understanding that networking is important. Now, it would have been a lot easier to just say, well, we'll just manage all that for you on, on a, in a separate VPC like we have, and I'll get to in a second. The reason we chose to put it into your VPC was so that you can access uh, anything you want to. As long as it access, you can have a direct connect to your on-premise. You could have um, transit gateways that bounce all over the world. Totally up to you. That way it all can be managed. And as long as the workloads are running in there, anything you need Airflow to access, as long as your VPC can access, you can do so. Now, in addition to this, though, we don't run everything there. So the metadata base that Airflow requires uh, and the Airflow user interfaces, we run in a single tenant virtual private cloud which means single tenant meaning that even within the same account, no two environments will use the same VPC in that case. They're completely isolated. Um, this allows it to you know, have the maximum sort of um, uh, isolation between all of the data and the tasks. Um, and, and it just you know, provides an extra, uh, our ability to offer a public network access to, that, um, to the web server via, that's controlled by IAM, as I mentioned. It makes it easier for us to stand that up so you can say, okay, I'm gonna give my users a URL, they get authenticated and away they go. Now, the, the trick with this is that those two networks have to talk to each other. And the way we do that is through using um, uh, VPC endpoints. So we have a database VPC endpoint that exposes that metadata base to, um, to the Airflow workers and scheduler, which of course it needs to do today anyways, until, uh, until Airflow separates that communication path. Right now, those containers need direct access to um, the database. We also provide, if you choose that private network option for your web server, we expose that web server through a VPC endpoint as well. Now, the trick with VPC endpoints is they're one way. So you can't, it's not just an open path that everything can go back and forth. Uh, so the web server can only be accessed from that VPC. And the database can only be accessed from that VPC. It doesn't go the other way. There's nothing within that service VPC that can reach out into your VPC, which is great from a security standpoint. Uh, it can offer some challenges, and we'll get into that uh, very much so in, in a second or two. So I want to dig into one area that I know some folks have had some challenges with, and that is managing these web server options and how you choose which one you're going to run, because it is a bit of a challenge from time. So we have two web server options we offer, as I, as I mentioned. One is a completely private network. That is, the web server is exposed by a VPC endpoint, you can only access it from your VPC. And this is for customers that say no internet, right? So there's a lot of financial institutions and other you know, uh, uh, folks that are have very sensitive data, don't want to touch internet anywhere. There's no gat gat gateway, there's nothing. It only has dedicated private endpoints to the services they need and nothing else. Um, we offer a public network option that uses that same authentication as you use to go to any other AWS console. So just like you can go to the S3 console or the EMR console, you can go to the uh, MWA console, click on a link and it pops up the, the UI. It uses that same IAM authentication. And because it uses IAM, you can also use a lot of the constraints that IAM offers. So you can say restrict to certain IP addresses uh, for creating the token uh, and all the other sort of additional um, restrictions that are available through IAM. So to explain this a little bit better, I'm going to dig into that same architecture graph, but I'm going to just zoom in on this one little spot where it's yellow on here and really dig into, okay, 
what's going on in here? Because it's a little simplified. This is the diagram from our documentation, but let's let's zoom in on what's actually happening here. So when you choose the public web server option, right, you've got the internet floating out there, and request to go look at the Airflow web server gets authenticated by IAM, goes through a load balancer, and then there's multiple web servers in that, VP, that uh, service VPC. It's going to pull up one of those web servers that's hosting your, uh, your Airflow environment, and that's how you access that data. If the web server needs to do anything, such as install Python libraries or, or, or anything like that, or perhaps you have a plugin that's running that needs to reach out, there's a NAT gateway built in, and all the communication that the, the web server needs to do, with the exception, of course, the metadatabase, which is in the same same uh, VPC as the web server, it goes through that gateway and it goes talks to all the things it needs to talk to. It talks to S3, CloudWatch, and all the other good stuff. So very straightforward, probably a very similar setup to what most folks have in their VPC today. If you choose the public, the private web server option, which again was really about having customers that no internet's no good, no internet access whatsoever, then we have that the input to the uh, the web server is that is that web server virtual private cloud endpoint. Still IAM, same IAM controls, same ability to restrict it. Uh, same load balancer, same everything else, but the web servers don't have any egress. They can't get out at all. And the VPC itself has dedicated private league endpoints to the things that the web server needs to function. So the same bits as you saw uh, before, CloudWatch, S3, SQS, ECR, the only addition is we put a dedicated private link in there for a secrets manager so that if you had a backend secrets, uh, you needed some other um, secrets backend, we can offer one, right? Because obviously, if you had something that didn't have that connection, you couldn't use any sort of secrets backend. So the challenge here is you know, there's no, if you need other things into this environment, there's no way for us to offer it to you today. So one of the ways we, we are helping to manage uh, basically all things um, with regards to the requirements and libraries and things like that is this local runner. All it is is a, um, a basically a, a GitHub repository that describes it's got the, the Docker compose files for a, uh, a Docker image. Uh, there's one for each of the supported MWA Airflow versions that are available today. And it uses the exact same options in the libraries, all the configurations, everything you can think of, the same ones uh, as MWA uses. So you don't have to worry about, well, is it going to be compatible with MWA if I do this and not that? It's all the exact same ones. Uh, and then it's got a few extra requirements and management utilities that are, that are, are helpful here. Um, but really, so the, the local runner itself is, is great. Just you can, first of all, it's just Airflow. It runs a lot. Like if you're familiar with Airflow development, it, there's the Breeze environment and all sorts of other things available there. You can just spin it up and run it. Um, we've had some blog posts of folks using it for um, CI/CD pipelines, so you can basically use it to test your DAGs before you push it into production, uh, because it's just the exact same Python libraries and everything else you're used to anyways. But we added a couple other utilities in here. One is the ability to test the requirements before you send them out, and another one is to package them up for this private network option. So I'm going to attempt to do a, uh, a demo that I'm not actually doing, but I did do, but I'm not doing. So I recorded myself doing this. And I'm going to attempt to do my best to actually narrate what I've done here. So I'm running the, the same local runner. This is the 2.2.2 version. And if you just launch the local end uh, shortcut, it will give you the list of all the things you can do. So as I mentioned, it's just a Docker image. So the first thing you're going to want to do is actually build the Docker image. Now, I already had it built. So it's obviously finished pretty quickly. But otherwise, it'll pull all the Airflow images and everything else to run it. So. If I want to test a requirements against this, I, so in this case, I have a very simple one that's using Snowflake. Um, I'm pulling in, which is the best practice, using the constraints file from that Airflow publishes to make sure that I'm only using compatible ones. And I'm going to go ahead and test these requirements to see if it works. And hopefully, other than a few minor warnings, everything says successfully installed. This is great. So what I can now do with this is say, OK, I know that my requirements are working. But let's say I have that private web server. It doesn't have any way to reach out to PyPy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the package requirements option. And all this is doing is it's just basically automating the PIP3 download. Uh, if you're familiar with it, basically it takes any library that's referenced in that requirements or any possible library it needs, and it's going to dump them all into the plugins folder of the local runner. All right. By the way, I fast forwarded this. This is running at like 10 times speed because if you actually waited for everything to download, this would be a very long session and you'd be tired of me long before I got done. 
So that was running at fairly high speed, but we've downloaded it all into the zip file. Now, the one thing we're missing in that zip file is the constraints. So I'm just going to run a quick little curl command, pull that restraint, that constraints file in as well, so that I have that along with it. Now, if I was a little smarter about how I did the requirements file, I could put the explicit versions in it, and it would only download the ones I needed. But since it was a bunch of dependencies, I didn't really want to figure that out. So I'm just going to pull the constraints file in, and I'm just going to add that constraints file to the same zip file that was actually generated uh, when I ran that package requirements. So I'm going to go through and pop, pop that into the zip file. I'm going to use the dash J, if you're familiar with it. It basically says ignore all the subdirectories and stuff so I can put it at the top level. I don't have to do that, but it makes it a lot easier to find the thing at the end of the day before you're done. So I can actually drip through, uh, zip through that and, and get to that information. Uh, and I'm just going to put it in that same plugins that was generated. And it's in there. Now, if I want to test it again, now I'm going to test against, instead of testing on the PyPy version of all these libraries, I can now run that same test requirements, but now I'm going to test it uh, on my local runner. Because you can see that it actually added, a, in this new requirements.txt, it added in the find links. It said where all the wheel files are going to be located. And it put in no index, which basically says don't go to PyPy. So that way it says don't even try to reach out to the internet if it's not there. And the only thing I need to do is update the constraint to point to that one I just downloaded as opposed to um, the one that exists uh, uh, you know, on the, uh, on the Airflow GitHub. And I'm just going to test again. Now, unlike the other requirements uh, installs or downloads I did, this one I didn't have to fast forward. Because one benefit with doing it this way is it's way faster to install Python libraries from the local wheel files than it is to pull them from PyPy every time which means that every update is going to be quicker. That means that every auto-scaling event is going to be quicker. It runs way faster. So that's just a bonus. So what we ended up with there is just a plugins.zip file. So in MWAA, you can choose... Now, this was originally written for Airflow plugins. But what it really does, it says anything that you put in this zip file is going to be unzipped to user local Airflow plugins exactly as you zipped it up. And it's just there now. It's on every single container. It's always going to be there. So in this case, I'm just going to go grab and say, uh, first I need to put it in S3 because that's where everything from MWA is accessed from. And then I can go through and update my environment to go through and say, okay, well, take everything from plugins.zip and dump it into each container's user local Airflow plugins file. And then I'm also going to be able to go through and say, and then I want you to install from this requirements. And again, that requirements, because local runners set the same way, pointed to the same plugins.zip. So that way, it's super easy to just say, okay, all the all the uh, all of your wheel files live here. The constraints file lives there. Everything that you need to install Python libraries is local, and this works too for not just PyPy uh, libraries, but this could be your own code repo libraries or any other sort of. A, you have a custom um, uh, uh, repository management. You can still use this exact same technique, package them up, put them on each instance. You can automate this as part of a CSD pipeline to automatically package everything if you need and have them available. And again, it's got the bonus that it's quick. Now, the other thing I did on here, which I talked over, which was I switched it to private network uh, for the web server just to show that's working. So now when I go through and pull up the requirements install log for the web server, there is an error that it shows because it's using the um, uh, MWA is using a newer version of Watchtower than is supported by default, which I'll get to in a second. But you can see that all of the, the Apache Airflow Snowflake providers is all installed. All of its sub files are installed. And so now the web server will work as if that was pulling it right from PyPy in the first place. So yes, it's not as easy as just saying, just pull everything from PyPy. But if you are forced into a situation due to security or due to your, your, um, your own sort of uh, uh, internal uh, regulation saying, I can't access the internet or I can't have this UI accessible from the internet, this gives you a way of actually packaging everything fairly quickly. And you're not limited to just this sort of packaging as well. So we have examples in our documentation. You can package um, shared objects in other libraries. So you know, there's a limitation where we can't currently install um, other YUM packages and things like that. So you can go to Local Runner, install those YUM packages, put them all in that plugins, and you know, these same permissions are all preserved by, um, uh, by the zip file, it will be unzipped in there. You can just simply reference, and again, there's some examples of doing that with a few different libraries in the MWA documentation. So it's a good way to go through and just say, I want stuff on each container, and this will get it for you there. So 
that's certainly one sort of best practice or a path forward as far as getting things into the, the, uh, the web server for Airflow. Um, there's some other important stuff to sort of keep in mind with this, and I wanted to, I wanted to make sure I covered. Uh, so there's a few, a few things I wanted to sort of cover that are, I guess, sort of gotchas or just things to keep in mind when you're, when you're managing this. The first is around logging. As I just mentioned, we updated the Watchtower. So if you're not familiar, Watchtower is a, is a public library that allows you to, to send logging to CloudWatch. Uh, it's built into the uh, Amazon Provider Package. It's part of the open source package for Airflow. Um, we recently updated to 2.0.1, which had a significant performance improvement uh, in this. And we're continuing to improve the performance on that logging today. Um, however, it is still possible to run into other limits. So uh, every AWS account has a limit on the number of logs you can do per second, how many tra it's, uh, transactions per second. Monitor, there we go. Um, it depends on the region, but there's a limit on how many you can do. It's a standard CloudWatch metric, so you can actually do a search for it uh, under um, uh, put log event, and you can see your current usage. Uh, so you can run into some throttling there. Uh, again, we're trying to optimize that so it's less likely to run into it, but that's something to keep in mind on. By the way, speaking of logging, there was a fantastic session earlier this week uh, uh, in the uh, Airflow Summit uh, regarding the uh, the logging backend. I highly encourage if you didn't watch that to do so. It's really, it's such a fundamental part of Airflow. It's a great opportunity to go and go back if you haven't watch it uh, and understand how logging actually works because it was a really great session. Um, another thing is about access. So as I've discussed a few times on here, you have um, the MWA service needs to access all these different things. It's really a service of services, right? Because it needs CloudWatch, it needs S3, it needs SQS. Uh, it assumes an execution role that in turn has to have permissions to go to SQS and S3 and, and all these other things. Um, so sometimes we'll get challenges on both the, the networking side of things. So again, maybe the security group is a little too restrictive. It doesn't allow certain out, uh, you know, uh, access out to these different APIs. Um, you know, it's, it's not always because we're having to run certain things on your VPC. You know, it might be that that's configured in a way that's a little more restrictive than, than we can work with. Um, and then the other part is that IAM permission. Since we assume an execution role to do absolutely everything, if you remove a policy, if you delete a KMS key, if you, if you, um, uh, remove an, uh, uh, a policy like SQS access, because like, why is this thing the SQS? You delete uh, the IAM role, all of a sudden stuff stops working, right? So these are the sort of the things to check out. There is an open source tool called verify underscore end. It's also on the, the AWS GitHub um, uh, repository that actually does a quick check. It actually assumes the execution roles, checks all the policies, sees if it's working, checks all the network. It's not foolproof. You can definitely do some things that it won't be able to pick up on. But it does a pretty good job as far as saying, okay, well, um, uh, I see that you are missing, you know, uh, ECR permissions, or I see that you're missing network access to this this uh, entity. Um, another sort of got you regards sort of migration. If you're going from um, you know a self-managed uh, 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 Airflow implementation, uh, a lot of times, first of all, you'll just have like like just a single EC2 or running, you know local Docker images or whatever. Um, and oftentimes you'll have just sort of like everything runs on one worker. You have all these sort of custom run times, all this other stuff that you can just access at a very low level. Um, and you know what, if it starts getting a little bit too big for, uh, for to run things, I'll just throw some more memory at it. I'll just throw some more you know, CPU at it. We are, in order to be sort of you know, somewhat serverless, we're running on ECS Fargate, we're running on these small containers. There's not unlimited uh, resources there, right? And so when you're thinking about going from a single sort of image or a large uh, large uh, instance uh, to an MWA instance, you've got to think, well, how do I, how is this going to work when I no longer am running the, my, you know, a single thing on my worker um, and I need to break it up into much little ones. Um, also important is that because of the way we're running the workers, especially if you have auto scaling enabled, that worker may not be there the next time you go to run it. Right, so it, the next task might run on a different worker. It might run on a completely different instance. Even if you only have one worker, that worker may have been recycled. Maybe it got bad. Maybe it got swapped out. Right, so you can't count on one task running on the same, you know, computer, if you will, as the previous tasks. And so, one of the things this can can limit is uh, is like, for example, running a bunch of bash commands. Right, the first bash command that you run as a task, 
The second one might not run on the same instance. So if it was like first bash command was downloading something, there's a pretty good chance the second bash command may not have access to that thing. Um, now, you can do a lot of great stuff with things like the Tascal API and XCOMs and things like that, but of course, there's limits there too. Uh, so really thinking about, well, how would this, how does each task work in an atomic way? Uh, and there's some great, um, uh, again, there was great sessions this week, and there's some great documentation on how to sort of make each task relatively item potent so it actually can run regardless of whether it, it wherever it happened to run, if the task is restarted or retried or run somewhere completely different, it'll work exactly the same way. And the last one I wanted to cover uh, is, again, I put it on here, full, full of minutes of shameless self-promotion. I, I did a session earlier this week that was about running uh, Airflow at scale. Um, it, uh, it was not specific to MWAA, but all the techniques there do apply. Uh, so uh, please, if you didn't get a chance to take a look at that one, go give it a look. Uh, there's some other great talks this week about running Airflow at scale, uh, and they all apply, right? So really looking at how do you run efficiently when you have a lot of DAGs, a lot of tasks. They apply when you're running on sort of small uh, ECS Fargate instances, just like they apply if you're trying to run them on Docker or VMware or something else local or something self-managed, or you're running it on EC2. All the same techniques matter. It just matters as to what scale you're running at, right? Or my, I, is it, because no matter what you're running it on, I don't care if you have a 16 extra large EC2, there is a limit that you are gonna hit, right? And so, Understanding how to manage those limits, how to spread out the work, how to make sure that your uh, load is being done and handled in a way that's that's effective uh, is going to go a long way, regardless of whether you're using MWA or self-managing or running anything else. It's going to be a big deal. Um, I want to take a second now and talk about our commitment to open source, because that's a big part of this. We acknowledge, I said, to start off on the very first slide, we're only running open source Airflow. That's all we're doing. We're not going to be changing or modifying or doing anything else. So it's super important that Airflow is healthy and well-maintained and well-managed. And so we're committing, so we have an a, a internal team. There are actually a bunch of them are sitting right here uh, to my left. I don't know, can we get a, um, uh, I'm going to put them on the spot and see if we can get a camera on these folks on this table. I don't know if we can or not. Um, th we have a few of our open source team here. And uh, you know these folks only work on open source Airflow. They're not committed to anything that's specific to MWAA. They, you'll see them on uh, on the Airflow GitHub, on the Airflow Slack. Uh, you've probably chatted with a bunch of them, whether they realized it or not already. Um, they're, they have a whole list of just Airflow commitments, Airflow fixes that are coming from uh, from many of the folks in this room and a lot of the folks that are watching uh, from the issues that are submitted to the Airflow GitHub page, uh, from lots of things we see. They're working towards it, and we're building that out to be, to be even more effective on making that. Uh, making Airflow better for absolutely everybody that wants to use it. So, want to get a little bit into you know what's next for for MWA. Uh, what are we working on now? And of course, I can't get into a ton of very specific details, but I can definitely get into some generalizations that let you know sort of what's sort of front of mind for us. Uh, and then when we open up to questions, I'm happy to to do my best within within the constraints I have to sort of uh, explain a little bit more about that. So the first one that's come up a lot, it came up in some sessions earlier this week, and I wanted to figure it, I'd, I'd put it right into the presentation so it comes out right away, is when are we going to offer the Airflow REST API access? No, that's a big, important thing. Um, we have not offered it yet, under, uh, as, as, as folks have looked to know. Um, and, and so why not? Um, one of it is just sort of, AWS has a very high bar for what APIs and, and how they scale and secure and everything else. Um, right now, uh, you know, everything's sort of running on the web server. So unless you have a lot of web server um, uh, capacity, that's going to be a little hard to manage a lot of API accesses. Um, and so we want to make sure that that experience with running APIs and Airflow is, is as seamless as absolutely possible so before we offer it. Um, you know, it's great today and people love to use it and we absolutely appreciate that. So we want to do it as quickly as we possibly can, uh, but we're going to do it in the best way we know how. And so both the MWA service team and the open source team that I just introduced you to are working together to make that a really great experience, not just for people using an MWA, but people using it any way that they want to use it. Um, the second one that I know comes up a lot is we want to support newer Airflow versions faster. Um, we are, you know, as I acknowledged right from the very beginning, 
we were lagging behind on that. We still are, are not as fast as we'd like to be. Um, so we're looking at how can we improve that? How can we do our security evaluations and do our deployments and everything else in a safe way as possible, but also as, as effective as possible? So we want to make sure that that time between when the, you know, the Airflow community uh, released a new version, including our internal open source team, when, they, when there's a new version, there's great capabilities and they're out there. We want to make sure we can reduce the time as, as to as short as possible when that's also available as part of the managed service. So regardless of where you decide to run it, that's available. It's the same experience everywhere. And then the last sort of, and it's a very broad category, but in general, we want to improve performance and, our, and the monitoring capabilities of this. And this is a pretty broad category, and it's sort of intentionally broad in that respect. Um, but we're constantly trying to improve what can we tweak, what can we do a little bit better, which settings are slightly better in one way or another, so that we can constantly make our performance that much better each time. And, you know, hopefully, and one of the sort of the promises of a managed service is that we're doing that so you don't have to, right? We're going through and saying, we're going to tweak and figure out all the little knobs and figure out which works best for our exact deployment to work better. So while you're, uh, you know, doing, you know, working on focusing or focusing on your business and running you know, getting the, the data pipelines working that you want. Um, we're busy trying to make that work better for you. Um, so improving the performance and the stability is a big part of that. We also are adding tools to help customers monitor their environments a lot more, providing a lot more details on what's actually happening in there so you can see what's going on. And also monitor, putting in tools where you don't have to see what's going on, where we're actually monitoring and saying, oh, you know what, we see something that's odd here. We're going to do something about it. Maybe we let you know. Maybe we fix it automatically. Uh, ideally, whenever possible, we're going to recover on your behalf so that you won't even know it's there. It'll just be working smoothly and, and you won't even know that there was uh, an intervention that occurred. So before I get into the questions, there's, you know, we do have some resources out there. We want to make sure that we, we have folks uh, sort of get into. Uh, first and foremost is our documentation. Uh, we publish new documents uh, every week, uh, pretty much. Um, we're constantly contributing, you know, putting in new um, uh, new um, examples where, where, you know, when people come back and say, hey, this wasn't as clear as we'd like, we go and refine it. We try and make it as easy as possible for folks to use. By the way, even if you're not using MWA, there's some cool examples in there. So by, the, by all means, poke around and see what's in there. There's some, there's some neat stuff you can do that applies. You know, one of the benefits of the way we're doing Airflow is most of the stuff we're doing applies to wherever you're having to be using it. And so this is a good way to do that. Um, you know, we have our product landing page. So when you get there, you'll see sort of the high level stuff that's going on. But within that landing page, more importantly, is there's a resources page. And that lets you actually see what are the latest blog posts. It'll automatically pull the what's new and the blog posts and everything else is coming from, um, uh, from our team of specialists and experts and things like that to let you know that. Um, again, highly encourage you to take a look at it. Even if you're not using MWAA, it's, it's, there's some great resources that explain everything from doing identity management, mm -hmm to, uh, as I mentioned, CICD and a bunch of other cool stuff there as well. And then last but definitely not least is the Airflow AWS Slack channel. You know, this whole table here is on there all the time as far as, you know, answering questions. Uh, I do my best to get on there uh, and answer as much as I can as well. Um, it's a great place for folks that are using AWS with Airflow in any way, whether it's with MWA or not. Uh, it's a great time to be able to go in, ask questions, you know, ask for suggestions. Um, you know, one of the best parts about Airflow is the community, right? And it's the idea of that people can share their experiences and share their, their solutions amongst each other and get better uh, aspect out of all of it. Um, so really encourage engaging with that. I'm on there. By all means, tag me on there. Ask me a question. I'm happy to answer as best I can as well. So with that, I want to, um, and I was a little quicker than I intended, but I'm hoping we get some, some questions out of this. Uh, we have a microphone here in the room, so we'll hopefully get some questions. Uh, I'll open it up to folks here in the room to ask questions, uh, as long as you don't mind. You know, say, we we can you can just tell, whisper us the question if you want, but hopefully you're willing to get on the microphone and actually say something uh, to show that there's actually humans here in Seattle and, and enjoying this. So, uh, any questions at all about MWA or anything that I put on here, or even stuff I haven't talked about on here? 